everything crashes. So <laughs> crashes. No. Then I got a call. And I was like, oh, someone's trying to get hold of me for like days. And I'm like, okay, I can do this like in one minute, and then I won't have to deal with her again. <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah, the the Wi-Fi in this house has been like it it goes great. It goes spotty and it's horrible, and then all of a sudden it runs great for a while. And then my neighbor was talking to me about, oh, how's the Wi-Fi? And I was like, oh, it's actually working pretty well. And then it all starts to happen. So Yeah. No, it's interesting. I get that. You know, Wi-Fi is usually pretty good um, in our house, um, but occasionally – it will. It's Comcast. I think we figured out it's probably more Comcast than anything. Yeah. And then it'll just like blip out for like ten seconds. Yeah. Like you know, go from what it does on your phone. Go from like you know one bar to four bars to one bar. Like yeah. no bars instantly, and then pop right back up. Yeah. Who knows what what the purpose of that is? But at any rate. Your house is pretty quiet. Where are your kids? <laughs> uh, the baby, the little one is napping now, which is good. Yeah. And then my son is upstairs. He, because he's on summer break, so I, I finally installed Minecraft Pocket Edition on the oh, iPad. So he likes okay. hiding and playing like Minecraft and, and coding and stuff like that. And he'll do that. And then the wife is packing for her trip tonight. So everybody's like... Busy doing yeah, stuff. I said, all right, I can just have quiet and just do this without like hiding, you know, in, in a room someplace. My um, my son used to love finding hiding places in the house anywhere mm -hmm. and just like make his own private fort and yep. just go. And it could be in a closet. It could be he used to do it behind the couch. Yeah. Yeah. And just create his. And once it was even under his bed, like there was a big enough gap <laughs> underneath yep. his bed that he used it as his hiding space. And it would just be his place to go do stuff like, you know, reading or playing, you know, games on his iPad. But um, so oh, it's just time to get like, away for him because yeah. he's got his sister there all the time and we're there all the time. And and I think that, you know, I think kids need I think he needs some like just unstructured Downtime. time. You know, yeah. just him, t his time just to sit there and veg out and do whatever he wants. And he'll play Legos, he'll he'll play Minecraft, he'll read, he'll, you know, and he's six, so. Yeah. But still, though, they're pretty developed at six. Yeah. You know, I'm like, you know, if you want this time just to sit there, because as soon as she wakes up, it'll be like, Everybody's, Chaos. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go yeah. to the pool. Let's go do this. Let's, let's go do, do something. That. Let's keep her busy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she's the one that needs to be like busy all the time. Right. Right. I totally know what you mean. So anyway, all right. So we should get this interview done. It's been so nice connecting with you again. You I don't know why we haven't talked with you sooner. We because get... like out of this morning came like like a sense of, for me anyway, a sense of direction and hope for where this stuff could be so it doesn't get lost, Ian, because that's my worry about stuff at Mozilla. It's like it just, it disappears, right? Well, and that, it's, uh, that was in the, in the questions. There was one, it's like, have you ever been disappointed by Mozilla? And I'm like, I'm not really disappointed. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I was like, they did say this morning that I could, you know, just be honest. And in the emails with Chris, it said, just be honest. So I'm like, you know, it's not a disappointment. It's just things change. And this is, this work is too important just to be like, there's a, there, well, we can talk about in the interview, but for me, like there's a, it's not a preservation of it for the sake of preservation, mm -hmm. right? There's a preservation of it in terms of engaging people who are new to this, right? Most people are still new to the stuff that Mozilla does. Mm -hmm. And helping them along the path and helping them realize that, you know, it's people like, you know, you and me and other people who've gone through the same type of thing and, and the thought process is, has evolved to the to, to a place where it is about like helping the average everyday person really yeah. engage in this, right? And, and it's so, also, well, I mean, it because I went through, part of this is also like when I was doing my doctoral work, and I, I'll bring this up later, Yeah. like in my doctoral work, we were, we were framing new literacies, and we were looking mm -hmm. at online reading comprehension and online reading comprehension assessments. And I sat there as a doc student saying, you know what, we, some of the discussions and the arguments that we had as, you know, my advisor and other researchers and, and doc students, 
it, you know, we had a lot of discussions and decisions that were made that we never documented. And I always yeah. felt like there was the need to, and, and because I believe in, in open, like, let's just save it. And maybe it's a digital pack rat. I know there's people that say that, but you know, let's take all these decisions and these discussions and document it and archive it and put it out there. So when it came to like the web lit stuff, I'm like, why don't we put this out there? You know, yeah. and let people see, or right, here's the timeline, here is what we've done. You know, there's a lot of great, you know, materials over time to show this heart, this trajectory. And, and it might build up to be something bigger and better in the future, you know, or it might be nothing. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's interesting because you do forget all the, that went into it in the process. But anyway, so let's, you know what, let's just get into the interview. Right, let's do it. We'll waste the interview. all the good all right, stuff. So, I know. All right. So do you want to start recording? And, yeah, I, and, I think it's um, recording now. And as soon as oh, I talk it about really? it, it'll, it'll, it'll cancel again. So it should be recording okay. now. Okay. Um, all right. So Ian, thank you very much for participating in this. Um, so um, can you tell me a little bit about your work and how you think um, you became selected as one of Mozilla's top 50 leaders? Um, so my work, I am at, I, I'm currently gainfully employed as an assistant professor of literacy education. Um, I think that that uh, you know is part of of my work. I'm pretty much an educator. I'm a researcher. Um, I try to. I'm not really a developer, even though people sometimes say that I am. I try to tinker and hack away at things and try to build things just to to help me think through. Um, things that I'm researching and trying to teach about, but primarily I'm an educator and I'm a researcher. Um, right now I'm a professor in literacy education, um, and what that means is that I focus on, you know, building in individuals that will soon be K-12 teachers opportunities to focus on reading, writing, socializing, and communicating in the classroom. Um, as part of that, I view the internet as the dominant text of our generation. So to me, literacy education and literacy also includes the web. Um, I, uh, as part of some of my research and some of my work, I've been involved in, um, you know, research projects in the past uh, that are open and available online, like the Walk My World project, where we have educators and students working together and researching and collaborating and, and building content online. Um, I'm also doing the digitally literate research project now, which is we are trying to reach out to educators in K-12 and higher ed uh, to figure out how they're using the internet and these digital technologies and instruction. That's online, you know, that people can get involved. Um, so I'm an educator, I'm a researcher. Um, I try and study uh, literacy practices of individuals as they read, write, communicate, socialize, uh, participate online. Um, How have you seen this evolve in in terms of your profession? Like when you started doing this work, have, what's what sort of evolution have you seen as it pertains to how people um, are engaging in this or not engaging in it? I think a lot of us are. It, it's interesting because I think that there's like multiple worlds. So like I have to exist in the the researcher, the academic world. I think in that space, since we first started this, I first started this as a um, as a doc student. It, it, way back when, I was a, an eighth grade classroom teacher, and I was trying to have a paperless system in my classroom for students to, to submit papers and work to me so I could look at process over time. Um, and that's when I started researching online to figure out what do other people do, and I realized at that time uh, not a lot of people were asking those questions. So I, I uh, got in touch with who would soon be my advisor, uh, Don Liu at University of Connecticut, and we started looking at new literacies and ultimately the new literacies of online reading comprehension. So we started framing that, and, and way back when, there, we would have to make the argument to people that the internet is the dominant text and that most people are, are increasingly reading online. And I think now, over the last decade, we've seen that um, 
increase exponentially. You know, now it's ubiquitous. So the, the academic side, there's a lot of people that you'd have to make the argument. I think for the most part now, people get the argument, but there still is a lot of privileging of one text over another. So there's a lot of people that real reading is a book with black print on white pages or you know whatever the, the, the mm -hmm. way it's you know situated. Um, but I think there's some privileging about some things are real reading and some things are not. You know, so mm -hmm. online reading might not be real. Um, in terms of K-12 teachers, educators, um, I think, and also higher ed, I think there's a lot of uh, K-12 teachers and, and higher ed instructors that still, um, you know, go back to old pedagogies, go back to old forms of text. I think they are still trying to shift, but I think it's part of that is it, it requires the educator to figure out their relationship with the internet. Um, and, and that motivates much of my work is to help them be more web literate and digitally savvy. And then in terms of students, in terms of you know K-12 students, higher ed students, um, I think that is, is all over the place as well. We have this misguided belief that there's these digital natives out there that are hardwired to be able to use the internet, uh -huh. um, which is a complete lie. But, you know, I, I think individually, you know, some children are, are, are more adept than others at, at adjusting to this. Um, so I think over the last decade, you know, in my work, as I've seen a lot of this evolve, I think we see um, the technology and these digital texts and tools become more ubiquitous in society, but I don't know if we're really being more thoughtful about how we use them or, or you know, using it um, more thoughtfully, uh, you know, in, in how we use uh, these digital texts and tools. Um, I, I, so what, what's an example of what you think, um, like give an example of what you mean by how, how would one use it more thoughtfully like or what are the things would that entail and what should we be doing to make it help people learn it more thoughtfully i think or use it more thoughtfully maybe that's how you phrased it well i mean in terms of you know for for educators for you know researchers for academics i'd like to see many of them you know i, I believe in open education open research open scholarship uh, you know, I like to see a lot of my, and I nudge a lot of my colleagues in higher ed to maintain a blog or a website and openly reflect about their thinking, um, you know, as they're conducting research or as they're trying things in their classroom or trying things in research or in the writing process, openly reflect and document those experiences so that others can learn, you know, about your process through your reflections. Um, same thing with classroom teachers. You know, I, I think that I, I try to nudge my classroom teachers, my students, uh, to have a digital identity, to have a place where they can openly reflect and uh, talk, you know, and sound somewhat uh, intellectual and share their lessons or share teaching materials, uh, openly question things that are happening in their classroom. So I, I'd like to see that sort of space built up, but that's only from my context as an educator. You know, I could see that being in other fields where people can go out and, and have a venue to speak their mind, um, you know, and, and be more thoughtful in the ways in which they share this work. You know, you mentioned um, working in the open a lot in terms of just um, uh, being able to share with people as a learning experience and, and the process of doing that is important as well. Um, can you, um, you know, think about a time when that's been particularly challenging, like working in the open? I think for me, it I think that working in the open has given me a lot of opportunities. You know, I, I've had people reach out to me and, and, and ask for advice on how to do that. Um, I've had um, opportunities come to me, whether it's a public speaking opportunity or, you know, when you're out looking for a job, when you're looking for employment, they'll look at your website, they'll look at the materials that you have out there. Um, I think that a specific challenge about that, I think for the most part I've had 
thankfully all you know opportunities created from that i think that there are challenges that i haven't encountered as of yet i think that as a as an open researcher there are challenges where people can and i'm testing that now to see it, if this is really a problem or not but it, as an open researcher there might be challenges as people look at credibility validity reliability mm -hmm. of your evidence um I think that there might be in the future challenges with publishers who, you know, if you're, if, if you're sharing openly documents or revisions over time, at what point, and I don't want to say it now because then publishers will listen and they'll go, oh, we need to go back and take a look at stuff. Um, you know, do, do, does the publishing, do publishers come back and say, okay, hey, we need to take a look at this and how much of this um, has been open before and shared out there. Um, and also, thankfully, I've, I have not as of yet had, you know, many challenges with with open in my own work um, because, uh, and this is something I, I wrote about in a, in a recent piece for Hybrid Ped, for Hybrid Pedagogy, is that, you know, I have a certain amount of privilege. Um, mm -hmm you know, in being able to go online and speak um, and share. Whether or not people are listening is another story. But, you know, I, I have an opportunity to go out there and share um, that not everyone has that opportunity. And so that's one of the things that I'm trying to unpack. So, I mean, for me, for the most part, I've had only great opportunities with Open. Mm -hmm. My challenge is now, how do I bring that to other people? How do I fight? Right how do I educate people how they can be open and what opportunities are there for them using the internet? How do I um, empower others, you know, so provide that education, but also empower them and make them believe that they can do this and then help them think through ways in which they can address any challenges and, and, and still create that open digital identity or identities. Um, and lastly, um, advocate. So that means getting out there and fighting and when we see privacy issues online, when we see security issues online, um, when we think about data gathering and, and other challenges with the internet right now, at least I think so, it's advocating for those that cannot uh, fight for themselves or don't, don't really understand most of the, the, the problems uh, and, and the reason for the fight. Do you, um, I mean, how do you... Um, um, how does this, um, what you just talked about, um, uh, intersect with like digital inclusion? Like, how do you think about digital inclusion within the context that you just talked about in terms of feeling as if you have a privilege that many people don't have? How would you find, how would you define digital inclusion? Um, I guess I would ask that of you. Like, you know, I think the way that we've been talking about it at, at Mozilla, and again, you know, subject to um, iteration too as well, is, is ensuring that all people have access, you know, to good opportunities for reading and writing and participating on the web. This is assuming that they actually have the physical connection too, though, right, to be able to do that. I think it's... Um, and, and this, my thinking about this has really been motivated recently by a string of blog posts. Um, a number of my colleagues that, that have, and I, I'd have to go back into like pin board and stuff like that to figure out the post. Um, but a lot of my thinking about this has, has changed over time. I think that, um, you know, I have a certain amount of privilege and perspective uh, you know, because of my gender, my race, the fact that I am a, a, a native English speaker, um, I have a lot of opportunities that many others do not. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of scholarship, my, um, you know, if, if I studied or researched a different field, there might be people that have um, varying perspectives about the, the, the validity or credibility of that. So I think that for the most part it has worked for me, but mm -hmm. this morning I woke up and I'm a white male, um, mm -hmm. for better or worse. And I know that a lot of my colleagues don't share that same, the same opportunities that I do. And then that bothers me. Um, and, and I've been trying to unpack that and trying to problematize that in, in my own work, mm -hmm. you know, trying to, is it something that I, 
uh, have to, you know, it, how do we address that? Uh, and for me, the only way for me to address it is to, to talk about it and to write about it and try to make sense and, mm-hmm. and fight for my colleagues and friends, you know, and, and every individual on the planet to be able to get online and share, communicate, participate, mm-hmm. be literate. Um, so I think that, you know, I, the earlier question is about the challenges that I've had being open. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, let's be honest, I, I really don't have any challenges being open mm-hmm. right now, but I do have a lot of friends that, um, you know, I have friends that because of their research interests or, you know, their identity or mm-hmm. identities online, they've received death threats. I've had mm. uh, colleagues and friends globally um, and here in the U.S. Uh, that say, look, I don't have an internet identity. I don't have an online identity because um, I'm afraid of how mm-hmm. to situate myself. Um, and to me, that's very problematic, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it's and I've been trying to figure out how can we. You know, I mean, that, that's why there's the education side, the empowerment side, but then the advocacy. I think that there's a need for, you know, probably those of us that can to speak out mm-hmm. and fight for those that cannot or believe they cannot. Um, I, and, and, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'm going to just switch gears a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about and ask you about Mozilla and um, how you first came to um, know Mozilla and um, how you got involved and what's that been like for you? So when I first started, I think it was jumping in on like the open badges and digital badges calls. Um, I was uh, reading a lot. I was a, and I still am in many ways, a, a lurker. I would pop in and out of the community calls or the Google groups and the different forums and try and read what people were doing go back and listen to community calls to make sense of, um, you know, what work was being done. I was also intrigued with digital badges. And so with a group of my doc students uh, at a previous institution, we we conducted a lit review on digital badges. We started building badges. Um, So I I first started with digital badges. And then I remember I I saw, it may have been a tweet or an email for signing up for one of the, the groups uh, from Doug Belshaw talking about this new mm-hmm. web literacy initiative. And because of my work with the New Literacies Research Lab, at which I had just graduated um, from University of Connecticut, so with my work in New Literacies, knowing about Doug's work with digital literacy, uh, I figured that it would be an opportunity to hopefully help out. Um, and so mm-hmm. I started right at the very beginning, joining the community calls and mm-hmm. getting involved, um, and and trying to take what I think I learned about the internet and these literacy practices, and mm-hmm. working with other colleagues um, to to develop this new web literacy uh, initiative. Um, so that's where I, I first started is in the community calls, you know, seeing what people were doing, connecting. Uh, reaching out, you know, joining those regular phone calls, um, learning right. how to mute and unmute the calls, uh, learning how to deal with the ether pads, uh, but it's basically <laughs> all of the minutia of working, you know, in the Mozilla community. That's that's how I joined in and, and working with great people and, and uh, you know, starting to build out my personal, you know, or professional learning network. That's how I started with Mozilla. And um, how has that evolved and what kind of impact do you think it's had on you generally working Um, with Mozilla? At the very beginning, it was important for me because I was just out of my doc program. I'm just trying to find my way. Um, And it was it was important for me to uh, it was empowering for me to sit in on the community calls with people that I respected and also and meet new people that had pretty much the same ideas that I had, you know, as you, as you get involved in dealing with the internet or whatever your research interests Mm -hmm. are, you, you think that you might be crazy for wondering or thinking about certain things or worrying about certain things. And you get into a group of like minds from all around the planet that 
um, were wondering and thinking and worrying about the same things that you were. So that was mm -hmm. important for me. Um, the other impact is that I have, you know, a, a, a group of friends, you know, a group of colleagues that are my personal professional learning network. Um, I, I can and I still do reach out to them for questions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that, you know, being involved in the work, especially with the Web Literacy Initiative, it's been beneficial for me because it helps me think through my own research and practice, but it also helps connect me with other people globally that are doing uh, this work as well. So it's, it's all, it, it, it's been a great benefit to me and, and hopefully I've been able to be, you know, some benefit to the people that I've worked with. What are, what are some of the things that you're thinking about um, doing with web literacy going forward? So, I mean, and this is some of the stuff we talked earlier about, but I thought it would be great for, um, you know, for you to, to articulate that oh, yeah. here. So, I mean, with the, with the web literacy work up to this point, um, you know, there's, there has been a lot of change, you know, and, and there's been transition in the development of the web literacy work. Um, and one thing that, that I think motivates this is, you know, I was, as I said earlier, as a researcher and helped develop and, and identify and develop and frame uh, new literacies, you know, writ, writ broadly. And in the development of that, one of the challenges is that as a doc student, as a researcher, I realize there's a lot of stuff that we didn't capture and share out. Um, and so being one of the, the, the people that has been there since the very beginning of this, I think there is a need to document that thinking over time. And even with the change, um, with the changes, there's a need to document that thinking over time. So, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of resources, there's a lot of information that's out there online about these changes over time. But also as somebody that's gone back and tried to look at this, there's a lot of stuff that's not there anymore. Um, and I think that's far more problematic. Um, I think that the, the web literacy initiative has a lot of advantages over other um, other ways in which we, you know, as a global community, other ways that we have tried to make sense of the internet and what skills are needed, you know, in these digital spaces, whether it's uh, American Association for School <clears throat> Librarians or ISTE or Partnership for 21st Century Skills or, mm -hmm. you know, list your 10 to 12 different organizations and initiatives trying to make sense of this, I think the web literacy work, that initiative, has been very successful mm -hmm. in sort of folding in a lot of the nuance from across these different initiatives and, and in many ways um, more successfully recognizes the full, at least at this point, the full set of knowledge, skills, and dispositions that are mm -hmm. needed to really be literate online. Um, you know, my own work was in new literacies and online reading comprehension. I, I think that's why I try to help fold in the, the building, composing, writing side of things, because I think it's terribly important. Um, so I, I, what I would like to see happen is, you know, there's a need to go back and sort of capture in, in you know, capture the decisions made up to this point create some sort of archive, create a, for lack of a better term, a, a wiki that captures and documents this thinking over time um, and make sure that we do not lose it. So I think that this is something that has to exist. It's a historical Yeah, a historical piece to it. Yeah. documentation and it has to live outside of Mozilla um, because, you know, the, the problem is as things change, you know, if you go back and you look at old versions of the web literacy initiative, the web literacy map, a lot of the old versions don't exist online anymore. And that's problematic. Uh, I think that this is stuff that has to be documented over time. This is something that, you know, should be saved. Uh, the, the calls saved, the etherpad saved, but then also just the, the I, I think there's something to be learned from moving, you know, through the, the different naming of things across the different versions of the, the web literacy uh, initiative. You know, why were th certain things named the ways that they were? Yeah. How did they change? 
um, because there is a, a tremendous amount of thought put into all of this work over time. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see uh, uh, one place that we can go, you know, a, a wiki where people can go and see the different versions, see how things interconnect, um, see, you know, get a better sense of the decisions made over time, have one, you know, canonical URL, one address, one web address for each individual element of the web literacy initiative of all of the work. So I can drill down and have one link to one, you know, competency in one mm -hmm. strand that people can go uh, and, and learn more about that. Um, and most of all, and this goes back to my thinking about empowerment, mm -hmm. uh, about educating, empowering, and, and advocating for others, I think there's a need to make all of this work approachable and accessible. I think there's mm -hmm. a need to speak to... Um, you know, not the the not those of us that sit in on those community calls with Mozilla, not those of us that would sit um, and and write out blog posts, not those of us that regularly uh, fact check and critically evaluate online online information. I think there's a need to be approachable and accessible for the average citizen, for mm -hmm. the average person out there that's not that 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 doesn't consider themselves digitally savvy or web literate, or they don't value, they don't consider how they could improve the, their, their web literacies. Um, but the people that aren't even having those discussions or thought processes, the people that regularly interact with the internet on a daily basis, um, and with your question before, how could they do it in a more thoughtful way? Um, they're not even worried about that right now. They're just mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, they're, they're, just, they're regularly interacting with the internet on a daily basis and not putting real thought into, how could I really improve upon this? How could I be more web literate? How can I be more critical about things in which I read online? How can I be more um, thoughtful in the ways in which I socialize and communicate with other people uh, globally when I use the internet as a, as a tool? So I think it, 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 to move ahead, I think it would be document, documenting mm -hmm. what we have, saving it so that further work is not lost, but at the same time, making it real simple, making it approachable and accessible for all. That could be short videos, you know, Snapchat, <laughs> snaps, you know, of different web literacies. Um, you know, Instagram images talking about, you know, uh, it basically creating explain like I'm five versions of the different web literacies, but mm -hmm. making it more approachable for everyone out there, not just those of us that are regularly thinking about this. So let's let's take it and sort of go to the other end of it in terms of the broader issues that Mozilla's you know focused on, right? The Internet of Health. You know what what for you? And some of this has come out, and some of the things that you mentioned are they. But like, what for you would you consider a healthy internet? Like, what is the ideal version of that of a healthy internet? I think when and it's interesting because. Um, a couple. This has come up a lot in, in recent posts online. I think Ed Williams had a piece about this last week. Um, I think when the internet really started, um, and I'm probably wrong about this, and people will make comments about the, you know how I messed this up. But I think for the most part, we had this general belief that getting everyone you know with the ability to get online and and socialize and communicate and share and present their own perspectives will be a great thing um, and all mm -hmm. voices will be able to share um, and, and I think that a, a healthy internet for me would be a place that anyone can go online they can share their perspectives share their ideas we can have a, a, a global community where people can read write communicate participate mm -hmm. with one another share their ideas without um, real fear um, uh, you know of uh, of negative things that would occur um, I also think that a healthy internet would be a, a, a global space where yeah. you know anyone from any part of the planet can go and and teach and learn and share and communicate and connect with other people regardless of where you live you know so I mean that's that's how I 
initially got involved with the, the Mozilla work and, and with digital badges and the web literacy initiative is that there's an opportunity to reach out and, and mm-hmm. find new friends in British Columbia, fr- find new friends in Finland, you know, work mm-hmm. with people all around the world and connect and learn about how the internet affects you or, and it doesn't have to be the internet, it could be your, your topic of interest and expertise. Um, but I think a healthy internet would be that mm-hmm. sort of space, whether or not we're there. <laughs> Always evolving. So let me ask you a question then um, about like, you know, you've worked with Mozilla a long time um, and have been really one of our, you know, contributing um, members for, you know, significantly for a while. Like what kind of feedback would you give Mozilla for how to improve what it is that they're doing? Um, I think, so the challenge for me was um, I've never, you know, one of the, as, as we were preparing for this, one of the things was like, is there any like disappointment that I've had with Mozilla? Um, there's no real disappointment that I've had. It's just a general, in the past, I, I, it was a bit unnerving as to how different initiatives would change, you know, and how one one piece of work or an aspect or an area of focus would be the uh, predominant focus and then almost instantaneously um, that would change and that would switch uh, to a different area or uh, an area of focus would completely be wiped out. Um, you know, uh, that was a bit unnerving for me. Um, and I think and, and that might be uh, the ways in which businesses need to operate, you know, in this digital environment. Maybe that's a sign of like the 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 the, the software or the development side, um, where there's you know we iterate quickly and we and we fail fast. Um, and so I, I don't know if it's a if it's really advice to give to Mozilla. Um, I wish that the, you know, for the web literacy work, I wish that that would continue. I wish that that would, um, you know, that work would proceed. I wish that more uh, capital of various kinds would be put into it. You know, I would, I would say, you know, let's, and this is one small example, let's get the community calls back on for the web literacy work. Let's you know, build up a website outside of Mozilla that is almost, you know, in charge of itself. Um, so, I mean, in terms of like telling Mozilla what to do, you know, or, or that would be more impactful, you know, part of my challenge in the past has been that there could be an initiative that suddenly doesn't about face or takes a left turn. Right. And that could be unnerving, but I don't really know if you know, if I'm the person to say that they should have stuck with a, a certain initiative. I think the web literacy piece is terribly important. I think that they should have really stuck with it, you know, but the challenge is that, um, you know, there's probably things happening behind the scenes that I'm not privy to that, that caused that change. So, um, tell, so let's, we have one more question for you and then let's 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 end on a note um around like you know give a story or tell a, or an or an anecdote about um a you know a, a project or something you've done that that's made you feel really good or feel like it's been successful okay so i think that um one of the so most of my work it, you know we're talking a little bit about um the, the health of the internet um, and and the truth of the matter is that's one of the things that keeps me up late at night and and the, the reason for that is my work predominantly is to help individuals educators students think about how to become more literate um, and to me as I said before that includes being web literate um, and that's thinking about knowledge skills dispositions our students are going to need when they graduate from whatever educational system we're in. And this is a challenge because we don't know what the future is gonna look like. So I work with people, I work with K-12 students, I work with K-12 teachers, I work with people that will soon teach in K-12. 
So I'm, I'm always trying to figure out what the future is going to look like when we both can admit that we have no clue what we're talking about. Um, and, and the challenge in that is that in this work, I recognize the fact that businesses, governments, other institutions are collecting data about all of us. Um, and so as we do this work, I'm getting people out there and online and I'm feeding this fire in, mm-hmm. in a way. Like as I teach teachers how to use Chromebooks and Google Apps for educators, I'm putting you right into their system. Mm-hmm. And that bothers me. Um, and then, you know, as I'm, as I'm teaching people how to be more web literate, I might set them up to fail. Um, and so this is stuff that really bothers me and it keeps me up at night and it, it keeps me on my toes. Um, you know, I try to make sense of it in my weekly newsletter where I unpack education, technology, and literacy. Um, so all of this is a, is a big, probably boring preamble to a recent event that happened to me. Um, I've been really, in order to address this, I've been really interested and intrigued by uh, the work with creating a domain of one's own. So, you know, I've been, I blog regularly, I have my, my newsletter, I have a semi-regular podcast where I interview experts, but I, you know, I'm creating my little spot on the internet, and I use that as a place to push content, uh, it, you know, in, in the, push content out or syndicate and pull eyeballs into my spaces. So I've been trying to fold a lot, the, a lot of that into my work in dealing with pre-service teachers and dealing with educators. And so I just finished up a bit of research. We're analyzing the data now where uh, my class of students, we had a small grant and we bought some web hosting from Reclaim Hosting. Um, so we bought some web hosting and we bought our students a domain and hosting space for a year. And the thinking is that we go back and we beg, borrow, steal to get them hosting space for another year and, and then another year beyond that. Um, and, and what I want to do is I want to take our teachers, my pre-service students, my pre-service education students, and have them have their domain, have them have their own web space and really figure out does this work for them, is this meaningful for them, and the hope that they will bring this to their future students. Um, and so. The, the, the interesting part of all this is that in working with these students, you know, they, we, we talked a lot about their digital identity and issues of privacy and security. And we talked a lot about, and it, this happened in the context of the recent U.S. presidential election and, mm-hmm. and, and this social climate. Um, and so it was interesting talking with them about the challenges and opportunities and what was heartening for me is that for the most part they were excited about the experience they were excited about and they valued the opportunity to not just create their digital identity but create their digital identity in a space that they own Mm -hmm. and it was really really interesting for me other than just using google sites or wix or weebly or you know any other spot where you have a free um you know, web address and, and, and domain, like they really value the fact that they could own a spot, um, you know, and, and that was interesting to me. Um, but then the challenge is that I go to, you know, I presented some of this early research and work to colleagues at my institution and there was a lot of pushback. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a lot of pushback about, okay, um, you know, why would you put our students out there and why would you have them creating this space where you know they could be hacked or they could be stalked or they could have somebody troll them um you know there's a lot of pushback about okay well this your students said it was a great opportunity but you don't you can't fully ensure that they will be protected online why would you mm-hmm. do that um so like I, I learned a lot from the experience, I gained a lot. I think it's helped me think more about what it means to be web literate. Um, but then at the same time, bringing those ideas in to my other worlds in which I need to live, you know, as a researcher or as an academic or as an educator with others, uh, with other institutions and organizations, 
it makes you really think about what are the, the problems and what are the challenges as we expect people to get out there and be web literate and have that domain of their own. That's great. Thank you. No problem. That was great. Anything, Anything else, else that we should add? talk about that uh, that I miss? Any other points that we should hit? No, I think you hit all the major points. Anything else you want to add just in general? I, I would say... Um, I like teaching and learning, uh, you know, online. I like socializing. I like being web literate. Um, you know, uh, for people that are reading this, uh, please, you know, connect, reach out on Twitter or whatever. Uh, social network is your choice. Uh, my material. You have a newsletter too, actually. It would be great for people. I have yeah, my website. I blog about pretty much everything yeah. that I'm trying to do. Uh, my newsletter. I'm trying to make sense of things happening in education, technology, and literacy, and trying to unpack weekly changes that, that are happening. Um, and I, I think for the most part, I do a good job at, at trying to make sense of it. Um, and uh, you know, I would say just reach out and connect and, and uh, let me learn from you as well. Well, thank you, Ian. No problem. Very thank much you. appreciated. So am I supposed to send um, in? I, I yes. read the email. I have to do like a little four hundred word post and send that to Chris. Um, yeah, it sounds like. And it. that, yeah. and then am I supposed to send in like a glamour shots or like a headshot? Uh, I I think they'll ask you for something okay, um, cool. or something like that. So they'll do that. Um, but if you can um, send this video or this this recording to me, that would be great. Will do. And, um, and then I'm also going to catch up with you on some other stuff, too, as well. Sounds good. Yeah, I've got some other some ideas for you to think about. But, um, but I have to jump on another call right now. But thank you. No it's problem. It's been, uh, been great, um, like I said, you know, touching base with you again. So. You as well. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Hey, I'll see you. Bye.